Hello, I'm Brenton Simons, and welcome to a very special program of American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, as we honor the eminent genealogist, Elizabeth Schoen Mills. Today, we confer upon her one of the highest honors in the field of genealogy, the Coddington Award of Merit. For those watching who are not yet familiar with our organization, I have the honor of serving as its president and CEO. We are the founding genealogical society in America, and today, as a national center for family history, heritage, and culture, we serve almost 400,000 members in 139 countries. We do this with scores of webinars, an array of publications, heritage tours, and 1.4 billion records covering all parts of the United States at AmericanAncestors.org. We invite you to join us. The Coddington Award of Merit is only occasionally conferred by our institution. It is a prize reserved for genealogists of the highest order. Elizabeth is a truly deserving recipient of this honor. As a scholar, educator, and leader, she exemplifies all of the finest qualities of the very best in our field. Elizabeth has positively influenced thousands of genealogists. And I can say this from personal experience. She was my instructor 26 years ago. I am deeply grateful for her wonderful example and for her supreme dedication to scholarship and to our craft over these decades. In this special program, we will be joined by Henry Hoff, editor of our register, and Nathaniel Taylor, editor of the American Genealogist, who will lead a conversation with Elizabeth. Nord Brew, a trustee of our society, will offer his comments and congratulations. Now, please welcome Nathaniel Taylor. Thank you, Brenton. It is a great privilege to be introducing and speaking with Elizabeth Schoen Mills here today. I first met Elizabeth 23 years ago at the Boston headquarters of the New England Historic Genealogical Society at a small convocation of historians and genealogists considering together the question of cross-fertilization between the two fields. Elizabeth, of course, has embodied both fields herself in her work for decades. A native of Mississippi and a graduate of the University of Alabama, Elizabeth began her publication career looking closely at Natchitoches, the oldest permanent European settlement in French Louisiana. While her work has gone on to be national in scope, it is still anchored in the Mississippi Delta and the broader frontier South, a complex community from which we all have much to learn. Over decades, Elizabeth's prolific publications and presentations have given us rigorous object lessons in how to research diverse families and complex societies. As editor of the National Genealogical Society Quarterly from 1987 to 2002, Elizabeth expanded the journal's focus to better reflect the diversity of America's genealogists and our population, well ahead of the curve that other journals are still following. That same period saw the germination of Elizabeth's two most influential methodological works. Understanding and citing evidence is the focus of her 1997 book called Evidence, expanded in 2007 and retitled as Evidence Explained. Evidence Explained is more than a book. It's also a website where Elizabeth has continued to break new ground, analyzing newly available records and introducing genealogists to best practices in citation and analysis of records. The other major work is her 2001 book, Professional Genealogy, a multifaceted multi-author handbook for professional and serious amateur genealogists for which she's compiled a completely new second edition, really a sequel with new authors in 2018. One core of Elizabeth's lasting appeal and influence is her knack for vividly illustrating important methodological lessons with examples drawn from her own research 
and reinforcing those lessons with memorable taglines and excellent presentation. A case in point is the now famous mnemonic fan principle for cluster research about family, associates, and neighbors, F-A-N, a foundational strategy for the broader field of indirect research. So Elizabeth has worn many hats, prolific researcher, exacting and visionary editor, and authoritative and engaging educator. In these first almost 50 years of her career, her first articles were published in 1973. Elizabeth has done more than any other living genealogist to professionalize, diversify, and advocate for our field. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the John Inslee Coddington Award honoree, Elizabeth Schoen Mills. Thank you, Nat. I am honored to be here tonight with you, with, with the society, with all of those who have joined us to celebrate John Inslee Coddington and the legacy that he left us. Now, as a younger genealogist, Elizabeth, I never had the opportunity to meet John Inslee Coddington, for whom the award is named, uh, but I know you did. Is there anything about him special that you'd like to share? He was indeed a special person. Let me just say that we had a lot of interesting conversations and not a few of them were based upon our shared ancestry. We are eighth cousins, one time removed. We both descend from that notorious, um, cantankerous, contentious Reverend Joseph Hall of 1635. But John did not inherit any of those traits from that common ancestor of ours. Every occasion that I had to, to spend with him, I found him to be the consummate gentleman. He was um, a wonderful raconteur. I did not inherit any of those qualities either. But I will say that I am honored to be here tonight to celebrate his memory and to discuss what we have done with this field that he entrusted to us. Well, I think that that's something that more than one of us find when we grow to know each other in the field. Uh, we enjoy the remote common ancestry we share, uh, but we usually enjoy even more savoring the shared problems that we might confront. Um, now, but let's get back to some more general questions about what it is that you do and have done so well and what you have seen over all, I think I had it right, almost 50 years since your 1973 publications. Um, so what have you seen as the greatest changes to the world of genealogy and related history over that career? I think the whole world has changed, but if I had to boil it down to four things, the first absolutely would have to be the explosion of resources that we have available to us now online for free or for cheap and with very easy access. The second would be the development of research methods and strategies that enable us to, to um, more productively use all of these sources that are available. The third would be DNA, genetic genealogy, which has just opened so many doors for us that we never dreamed that we would be able to use. And the last would be the development of standards for research and writing, which is something few people want to talk about. So which of those other exciting topics shall we delve into? Well, I think we might end up touching on, on more than one of those. And I see some of them as related. So we might also end up circling back uh, now, uh, I have some questions, and I think you have some answers already in mind, uh, but we do want to encourage uh, people who are tuned in now uh, to enter questions that you may have as you think of them, uh, or if you already came with a question, into the Q&A uh, box, uh, and in due course, we may pick up on, on one or more of those. Uh, now, one of the first things you mentioned, and it's something that I also well, all of us dig into uh, and savor, but it's also a challenge, the explosion of records. Now, the internet has revolutionized broad public access, both free and paid, and that's the, that's the source of a whole other conversation. 
uh, broad public access to archival documents of family of value to family historians, really from every jurisdiction and and every major library, including American ancestors, uh, that has anything of of relevance. How has this explosion of access affected how well genealogists learn to work with evidence and sources? Ned, that question gets to the heart of the second change that I mentioned, and that's the development of research strategies. Every genealogist today has more resources available to them online than they will ever live long enough to use. And yet we hear people saying, I can't find this. I can't find that. There is no record. For me, the solution is not just finding the perfect record that says exactly what we need because there's such diversity of, of what was created and what has survived across time and in different places. I think the solution lies in how we use those records that we are able to find. And I'll tell you why this point is dear to my heart. Back in 1982, I had been a board certified genealogist for six years. I was in a state that a lot of families passed through on their way west. I lived in an area where I could comfortably drive to a lot of courthouses. And so that was pretty much what I was doing for my clients. They wanted me to solve their problem by going to this courthouse or that courthouse and look up the record that was bound to have the answer to their burning question. It didn't quite work that way. <laughs> I was also a member of this new professional genealogy uh, association. And in that era, it published a quarterly newsletter. There was always a question of the quarter. The question would be posed. All of us would write back snail mail to the editor and give our responses. And the next issue would publish the responses. So in one issue, there was this question that caught my eye. What is your success rate in solving client problems? When the responses were published, they floored me, particularly one of them. This was an anonymous professional. It did include a Salt Lake City byline. That professional said, I accredited in Southern research and my success rate in solving those problems has been so dismal that I have quit taking that kind of assignment altogether. That hit me hard because that was my specialty. And if this professional in Salt Lake City with all of the access to, to all the records in the world, we, we tend to think about Salt Lake City. If he or she had problems solving, Southern research enigmas. What hope was there for me living in the boondocks with much more limited access? And that prompted a lot of soul searching, but it also prompted problem analysis of a wee bit different kind. What I did was to go back through my whole six years worth of client work. And I created two stacks. One was the problems that I had managed to solve. And the other one was the problems that I had not managed to solve. And you can imagine which stack was the highest. The burning question was what made the difference between success and failure? And by the time I got through analyzing what happened with each project, I had reached the conclusion that success did not depend upon my knowing that such and such courthouse has such and such records that I could go to, check the index, look for the names of the key people, see if there was a record that had all the right answers. Instead, it was a matter of applying strategies to kind of milk things out of the records that were not obvious. And you mentioned the fan club, to, to use the records of the friends and the associates and the neighbors of this problem person to see what their records might have to say about them or what it might say about their origins where I might find them. Or to use those bits and shards of information to build a case in all those cases when there was no one document that said so in plain black and white. That analysis was my aha moment, and I think it changed my life as a genealogist. It was also, I might add, the point at which I proposed to the Sanford University Institute of Genealogy and Historical Research, which I was already affiliated with, but I went back to them with a proposal that we create a track for advanced research methodology. <laughs> 
It took three years to convince them that there would be enough interest to, to carry that for one year. And we are now in our 36th year. It's under the capable hands of, of my successor, but there've been a lot of lives changed in the 36 years since then. That is a terrific deep dive into what seems like an important transitional moment uh, from an earlier, perhaps simpler time. But I'm, I'm interested in one point there that you did bring up. The, uh, and perhaps is there a, a frame shift also in the way you spoke of, in an earlier time, people, uh, a, a more simplistic notion of success or failure. Uh, and that suggests to me that many of the people who were operating, even as professionals, when you first began in the 70s, might not have been able to couch negative evidence or crossing something off a list as actually a kind of success. And, and uh, you know, calling, uh, calling, you know, the failure to find somebody in such and such a courthouse a failure, it's not always a failure. There, there are ways in which that also advances a complex case, but you also moved the story to that much more interesting moment, uh, which was, must have been an important evolutionary moment in the Institute for uh, Genealogical and Historical Research at Samford, uh, when that uh, the advanced methodology track was was introduced there. This is something again that you have seen. Uh, and were instrumental uh, in a relatively early phase of professionalizing that kind of educational track um, to, to influence more than just your own clients. Uh, and I think we might, we might circle back to that because there are other things that you brought up a few minutes ago, which I think they're gonna be champing at the bit to hear about. And one of them is, uh, is DNA. Uh, which hardly a conversation can go by without bringing it up. There again, like the availability of records uh, and the increasing availability of records, the, the explosion uh, with the internet and now with new strategies for putting things online, uh, we have another enormous new toolbox, the DNA toolbox. It's still relatively new uh, and it is very much still evolving. Um, how has the availability of DNA evidence fundamentally changed how research is, is conducted? Um, and I'm asking you both about cases that you've dipped into and, and what you've seen. Uh, and sometimes I think that people who come in not having begun to do research before DNA was in the toolbox um, tend to have a little different idea about where it belongs in that larger toolbox uh, than somebody like yourself um, who's been at this for a little longer? It is confession time first. I am not a genetic genealogy expert. I would say I'm a utilitarian user of, of DNA. And yes, I have used it. Um, I've used Y, I've used mitochondria, and I've used autosomal to solve problems that would say five to seven generations removed. Whenever I've done this, I have always submitted my work to be peer reviewed and it has passed and, and been published in, in respectable journals. But as a genealogist trying now to use DNA, I know enough to know how much I don't know. And I think that is an important point for all of us. And so my advice would be twofold. First of all, DNA testing is not a substitute for documentary research. All the criteria of the genealogical proof standard still has to be met, including that first criteria of reasonably exhaustive research in all of the resources that exist for the time and place. DNA is not a shortcut. A second, genetic genealogy is more complicated than most of us realize when we first sent off that test. And we see so many assertions today of problem solved using DNA. I saw one today when someone said that they were solving problems at 10 and 11 generations in the past using autosomal DNA. But usually when with that far back, these problems aren't really solved. It's more often the case that the assumed solution is based upon a misunderstanding of DNA evidence and what we can do with it. We've, we've all heard that newfangled saying that DNA doesn't lie, but 
it can very easily be misinterpreted. And, and so what I would encourage everyone to do, if you are working on a difficult problem, especially if it's past the grandparental uh, level, um, several generations removed, when you think you have it solved, write a proof argument that correlates both your documentary research with your DNA findings, and then have that proof argument critiqued. Don't go to a friend. Do not go to somebody who is already working on this problem with you. Go to ideally a credential professional, so an outsider who understands and is, is a real specialist in genetic genealogy and let them give you an objective critique. Well, you've offered sage words and I am coming from exactly the same place. Uh, I am, uh, I think I have an, some of the skills to be able to read and critique and spot the weaknesses in a DNA argument. And that's increasingly something that all journal editors uh, you know, need to be able to do. Um, but what one thing you've said that's uh, very important is remembering that any DNA evidence only fits into a proof argument that must include other things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the thing it reminds me of uh, going back to the 70s and the 80s, uh, people who thought that anything appearing, uh, any solution that appears uh, with the use of computers <laughs> is somehow magically correct. And it's only another way to juggle the same questions and to apply the same critical faculties. Uh, and I think there is a danger that for people who feel that DNA is, is solving the problem, it's not giving them tools as part of the larger problem. Uh, and you've articulated that well. I think you and I are both curious about seeing how the field evolves because I'm certain that it will be useful to solve things that we aren't solving now. Uh, and I'm equally certain that I'm not gonna be the person who leads who leads those methods there. Um, now, one other thing that goes back to a few minutes ago, uh, you mentioned the frontier South, you mentioned the beginnings of your professional career uh, as a gopher for others. And that's something that I think any professional does less of now as the boots on the ground, uh, but perhaps it frees us all uh, it frees more of our attention and our professional uh, ability to help people to uh, be used in analyzing problems, not just fetching things. Mm -hmm. uh, and But still, your focus, your geographic focus, uh, and your own home turf um, is the frontier south. Uh, and I am familiar slightly with your website, Historic Pathways. Uh, whose uh, the, the tagline states that it is a portfolio of research drawing forgotten women, yeoman farmers, and the enslaved out of the shadows of history. Uh, and that's a compelling way to describe your focus in a very complex part of the country and a very complex group of populations living together. Why did you choose that specialty other than that it's so difficult. I chose it or it chose me because I do believe that everyone deserves to be remembered. There is no one whose life was so insignificant that we cannot learn from what they have to teach us. And if you'll indulge me in another flashback, I'll tell you why I feel that way. Back in 1987, again, the Association of Professional Genealogists asked me if I would deliver the official presentation at that year's National Genealogical Society Conference. I was given carte blanche to use my topic and what I chose was a woman named Margaret Ball that I wanted to do a case study for. Margaret was like so many of our ancestors, she just popped up on the 1850 census. No one knew where she came from. The 1850 census showed that she was living with a young adult son, Ferdinand. Older members of the family remembered hearing stories of Ferdinand, and one of the stories that they heard was that he, his mother died 11 days after he did, and she died of grief. 
And so they wanted to know this grieving mother. And they had spent 50 years, literally 50 years, searching balls everywhere from Maine out to California, trying to find Margaret somebody that married Mr. Ball and then had this son, Ferdinand. And um, it, we solved the problem. It was a very complicated problem. There was no Mr. Ball who was a husband of Margaret. She was Margaret somebody else. And she took the name Ball when she went to Texas and just showed up there as Margaret Ball. She used several names over the course of her life. Each time there was a social or a legal reason why she used that other name, but it complicated the problem. Um, she was not literate. Her parents were not married. She was poor. And so they were bundled up in, in, in this more grieving mother. There were so many different lessons for us to learn. And so I developed a case study for it. I showed up that day and I gave the presentation and the session is over. People come up and they ask the personal questions and most people left. And then I'm free and I go to leave and as I'm walking through the door. Well, I should say it was a huge exhibit hall because there were about seven, 800 people that had signed up for the, for the class. And so they cut off half of the, uh, the exhibit hall to make a lecture hall out of it. So when I walk out of the lecture room, I'm right into the middle of the exhibit hall and I hear someone calling my name. And I glance over and there is this person that I knew who was sitting at, a, at one of the booths. And he says, come here, Elizabeth, I wanna ask you something. These people have been coming through talking about this case study that you did and all of these different things that you did for Define Margaret Ball. And I have to ask you, why did you bother? She was a nobody. Yeah. The reality is that most of our ancestors were nobodies. Most of them died without fame or fortune. Most people in the past could not read or write. They didn't leave all of those wonderful records that historians can find for the elite. And Yet their lives have married and they have more ability, in my view, to teach us about the past than we'll learn from the lives of the rich and famous. Wow. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's very powerful. And to me, what, one of the things I hear is that there are two compelling reasons. Uh, and I think different people who approach the field have perhaps these two compulsions, perhaps in different measure, uh, and I think that's probably okay, but the, the moral compulsion to, uh, to, to bring people out of obscurity, to bring nobodies out of obscurity, uh, is powerful. Uh, there may also be an intellectual compulsion to solve difficult problems because nobodies are harder to find than somebody's. Yeah. Very true. And one of the things that you just added to that, uh, just in, in the last couple of minutes, is you mentioned that, well, is researching somebody's the province of historians, as opposed to researching nobody's something that we genealogists can do? I think you and I both know that there is a whole class of historians, social historians, mm -hmm. who try to and succeed in researching nobodies in other different ways. Now, in a couple of different times, uh, moments just so far in this conversation, we've touched on uh, you know, the, the parallel tracks of historians and genealogists, but I think also the, the implied differences. Uh, and this is something that goes back to the first time I met you at a discussion, but you know, specifically convening historians and genealogists. Has the interface between the two professions, between people who identify as one or the other, has it changed over the last generation? Has the professionalization of genealogy had any effect on that balance, that interchange, that tension? Ned, I would like to think that we have turned a corner, but I'll admit this has been the disappointment of, of my work in the field of genealogy. When I came into genealogy, there were those two main issues that separated genealogists from historians, and that was education and relevancy. Genealogists had no academic framework, no degree program to change them. The best of them were self-taught. 
But the historians, which was the field I was then training for, had this legacy of degree programs. And so there did prevail the view that the work of unschooled genealogists was naive and not necessarily to be trusted. But we now have programs from Boston University to the University of Strathclyde. We've made progress. But for the most part, we are still outside the framework of academic history and that traditional divide is still there. And that second issue of relevancy is still there. Um, what does it matter who my ancestors are or yours? So um, what does it matter if I descend from the Heathcliffs of Dover or the Heathcliffs of Farnham Parish? As one historian put it, that's excessive attention to detail. But I would argue that historians cannot give us sound interpretations of any event or any social group without understanding the relationships, the kinships that needed the people together. Because at the most basic level, families and their needs have shaped the actions of the George Washingtons and the George Washington Carvers. Well, I think you're you're absolutely right in that. And there's no getting around the the reality of the disappointment that you and, and I and others who've hoped for more uh, for more rapprochement, for more cross fertilization, mm -hmm. uh, it, it it doesn't always come. It doesn't seem enough, even though there are some of both of us historians and genealogists who really do both or who see the relevance of two or more approaches, uh, and so. I, I wouldn't lose hope, uh, and it's important to take a long view of, about those things. One of the things that, that you and I have both been involved in is uh, scholarly genealogical publishing, you know, the journal article that represents the way to do it right uh, and the value of that for people learning to do what we do. Um, what role does scholarly genealogical publishing you know, play in disseminating the kind of professionalizing research skills that have really uh, grown so much in our field in the last 30 years? Uh, how could genealogical publication change to, to better serve that role? I would not suggest any change on the part of the scholarly genealogical publications. I do feel that they and the family histories like those that EHGS publishes that meets today's standards play a very vital role in education. People learn by doing. Generally with, with genealogists over the past 20 or 30 years, they've learned from the software that they use. They've learned by seeing what others are doing from what's being done at the tree building sites. And yet those tools leave them with a lot of problems unsolved. It is the scholarly journals, the scholarly publications that give them hope that these problems can be solved and they show them how to solve the problems. Well, for me, at least you're preaching to the choir. I, mm -hmm. I yeah, fully I agreement with that. Uh, and, but it, and it is an interesting problem that people who are drawn to genealogy through online portals and tree sites uh, who won't, their first experience used to be a printed family history in a local library. Uh, and now the first experience is something that has not gone through any editorial process, although we're both familiar with books that don't have any, don't have any critical editorial process in them at all. Um, so because the first experience, the first exposure is different, uh, sometimes it seems harder now to uh, lead people to the trough of scholarly research as a model for learning how to do it yourself. Uh, but I think that, and I, I realize we do need to wrap up within a few minutes. Um, I think that does lead us back to a more general question about um, how you see the future of uh, scholarly publishing. And I had particularly uh, in mind with this, uh, not so much the examples in the scholarly journals, uh, but the rigorously published methodological works that you've really pioneered, uh, Evidence Explained, and the, and the professional genealogy handbooks, uh, and the articulation of not only of standards, uh, but of uh, proper pathways for how to learn the skills to meet the standards. Um, is scholarly publishing done? Have we created standards? And this actually 
matches a question that came in from, from one uh, attendee. Uh, you know, what's left to articulate in standards? Uh, where do we go from here with the publication of methodological guides? Or has it already all been done? Are there, what are the ones that you would like to see next published that don't yet exist? Oh, I have a long list. I won't live long enough to do them all. <laughs> um, we definitely need more emphasis upon the strategies and how to use evidence. So many people think of evidence as, I found a document that says so in plain black and white, so I've got evidence. But then again, as you mentioned earlier, there's the, there's the indirect evidence, the, all the, the hints and the clues that we can build in a certain way if we learn how to use it, and the negative evidence that you mentioned earlier. There's a lot of room left for new, new tutorials. Yeah. Uh, and actually, this brings to mind one question, another question that's come in from an attendee, uh, which it seems almost like a challenge, but it, it it seems to speak to one of these scenarios, particularly with the evolution of methods and with the acquisition of new tools and particularly the DNA toolbox. Uh, now, this isn't somebody who's grilling us on DNA methods, but more the philosophical question. Uh, the attendee has written, how do you feel about DNA evidence overturning conclusions that previously met the genealogical proof standard? There is no such thing as case closed in genealogy. Yeah. Any conclusion that we make today can be overturned by the discovery of new evidence, and DNA is just another form of evidence. But the evidence has to be valid, and it has to be validly used to overturn case conclusions. Yeah. Uh, I want to add one uh corollary to that answer, which I think is absolutely on, uh, and that is that the genealogical proof standard, when met, does not close a case. It does not, it does not, it, it itself does not solve a problem. Uh, and in fact, you know, one of the elements that we are ingrained to uh, remember uh, is that new evidence may be out there uh, and that the due diligence will continue. The reasonably exhaustive research might continue past the publication. And so that's that's something that uh, is part of the, it's part of the process, it's part of the thinking. Um, there's one other very specific question that takes you back to a moment in your career and a particular case, which of course is well known. Uh, and I, I, because I'm curious myself, I, I do think uh, we can bring this up. Uh, and this is, uh, brings us back to, uh, all the way back to the early years of your career, um, as somebody who explored and published about Alex Haley's ancestral research and, or ancestral writing, um, the question is, what pushback uh, to your experience was a result of, of this? Is there, um, do you have uh, reflections on uh, that episode that are, worth articulating from, from this vantage point. I think we're 30 years, about 30 years out from that now. Probably more than that, more like about Oh, sorry, 40, 40, 40 yeah, yes. More like about 40. Yeah. Um, it was the most inspirational event that has occurred in genealogical history. And it has certainly driven, uh, compelled many people to, to get into genealogy and to discover their roots. Um, the same um, things that I drew from it then, I would draw from it now. I mean, we have to observe standards. Um, there, I understand all of the, the difficulties that was involved and the, the emotion that is involved. But in the end, if we do something in the name of, if we present it as genealogy, it should be backed um, very uh, fact-based, if we want to present it as these, a novelized history of a family, which I have done, that is a perfectly legitimate way to present history. Different people learn in different ways. Yeah. Uh, you just introduced the, the follow-up I wanted to ask, uh, and that is how you see your own uh, creative writing in the novelization of 
research subjects that you have also that who have, people who are real people who have also been the subject of your genealogical research. Um, how does the one influence the other? Not every genealogist is cut out to uh, also take up a pen creatively in the way that you have tried and done. Uh, do you have any words of encouragement for that or any uh, insight about the process of switching pens or switching thinking caps that's involved in uh, avoiding the possible problems of conflation of the two? It is hard to avoid conflation of the two. Hmm. If you're passionate about a subject, if you are passionate about a family and you feel they have much to teach to the world about what life is like, it is a temptation to present this in a more casual form that will appeal to a wider segment of, of readership because many people are not turned on by genealogy as hard as that is for you and I to understand. The one caution I would have there for everyone is to remember that we are writing about other human beings and we have an obligation to be as to, to do as much thorough research as we can on their lives to get to know them and to present them in as intellectually honest a way as possible. Don't make them say what you want to say, but present them as they were and let their voice be heard. It sounds to me that you've, you're coming down more on the side of genealogy than the, than the creative writing uh, side but that there is room for both uh, as long as they're properly articulated, properly, you know, discreetly articulated. As long as the person is respected for who they are. Yeah. Um, you know, that really brings us pretty close to what I could see as a, as a kind of final question, a sort of valedictory question, um, although there are two. There's one that's come in from an attendee uh, and then there was one that that I had sort of articulated myself. It's a little bit different. And I'm going to ask you both of them. Okay. And I'm going to keep them in mind and, and tackle them one in whatever order you wish. And one of them is, what advice do you give now at this point in your career to aspiring genealogists and particularly to people who are really beginning it, who have who have for one reason or another, uh, really said, I am at the beginning of this path. Um, but another question is, you know, I mentioned at the several minutes ago, you know, these are the first 50 years of your career. And <laughs> you've also got some thoughts about where <laughs> your path is kind of starting off from here and maybe going somewhere else. Um, so both for yourself and also for others who may be really beginning uh, what are what are the thoughts that you have about the future? I am I am a poor prognosticator. Hmm. Um, I'm too much of an optimist because I love this field, and there's so much that I, I I believe in this field. I believe in the role that it has to play and the contribution it can make to society. But I am um, I'm optimistic. I Certainly people coming into the field today, my advice to them would be that whether we approach genealogy as a hobby or whether we approach it as a profession, um, success is all about our mindset. Research is the fun part. We all love chasing down those records and trying to find this, this particular fact. But if our conclusions are going to hold up across the generations, our fun also has to be disciplined. And so my advice now is that there is no difference in standards for the hobby or the profession. We are all working on the same families and a mistake by any one of us is going to create problems for everyone else that's working on their family. Now I know that many genealogists have always argued that I'm just doing this for my own family. I don't have to do all those things that professionals do. But there's a reason why professionals do things the way they do, why they have standards, and that is because this is what it takes to ensure accuracy. And today, even more so than in the past, the work that we do as private researchers matters. All those online trees, all those instances of this is just my tree for me and my family, 
Then you aggregate it into databases from which algorithms are developed. And based on those algorithms, these tree building sites are sending us out hints about our ancestors. And they are based upon what people are claiming in their trees, rightly or wrongly. And even when we take DNA tests, the through line suggests that, that those suggestions so many people take as gospel, they think it's based on DNA, it's based upon what other people are claiming in their it's, trees. And so we're all totally together. Yeah. Standards for one or standards for all. Hmm. Wow. Um, are you yourself? Uh, can you share your own ideas for the next few steps in your path? No. Okay. <laughs> Well, never announce what you're going to do. Life intervenes too much. Wow. Um, well, fortuitously enough, um, that appro entirely appropriate and short response to that last question um, brings us all, just about to the end of, of our time for this conversation. And I think there's, there are unanswered questions, but as, as you well know, um, that's the best way to leave an audience. Um, and we do we do have to go now to uh, there's an award to be presented, I believe. Um, so it is now time. Uh, and with thanks for this conversation, Elizabeth, it is now time to introduce the editor of the New England Historical and Genealogical Register, Henry Hoff. Good evening. My name is Henry Hoff. I'm editor of the New England Historical and Genealogical Register. I was John Coddington's executor, and that's one reason that I'm here today to say a few words. The Coddington Award of Merit was created in 1987 as the New England Historic Genealogical Society Award of Merit to recognize the highest standards of excellence in American genealogical scholarship and lifetime achievement in the field. The first re recipient in 1987 was John Inslee Coddington, for whom the award was renamed after his death in 1991. John was born in 1902 to American parents living in France. In 1924, he graduated from Harvard, and he later taught history there and at other colleges. This is very much the short version. More importantly, he joined NEHGS in 1923, and developed into an enthusiastic and highly skilled genealogist. His interests were wide ranging with many unexpected connections of European and American families. His bibliography was published in 1980 as a tribute to John Inslee Coddington on the 40th anniversary of the American Society of Genealogists, an account of, his, of John's life and honors and some publications is in the July 1991 register. Subsequent recipients of the Coddington Award have been Charles Hansen, 1995, David Green, 2001, Fred Dorman, 2006, Gail Harris, 2010, and now Elizabeth Schoen Mills. Elizabeth has been widely recognized as the genealogist who has had the greatest impact on American genealogy since the publication of Roots, and I completely agree. A bibliography of her publications is included in her sketch on Wikipedia and on FASG.org, and many of her articles and transcriptions of colonial records are on her website, Historic Pathways. She has presented more than 1,000 lectures at genealogical conferences and university-based genealogy programs. She was the editor of Professional Genealogy, Preparation, Practice, and Standards, and of Professional Genealogy, a manual for researchers, writers, lecturers, and librarians. Her codification of genealogical methodology is the basis of the genealogical proof standard, now the standard in the field. She was the editor of Evidence Explained, which treats the citation of historical sources. Elizabeth has been in the forefront of rec re reconciling historians and genealogists by helping professional genealogists gain respect from historians. Several of her articles on this subject are in historical journals or 
uh, are lectures delivered at historical conferences. Elizabeth is highly regarded and admired by her colleagues everywhere, including John Coddington, who had called her articles and lectures very impressive. And I was there to hear him say that. For her many valuable accomplishments and contributions to genealogy, the New England Historic Genealogical Society is honored to present the Coddington Award of Merit to Elizabeth Schoen Mills. Her work always demonstrates the highest standards of excellence in American genealogical scholarship and lifetime achievement. And indeed, her work has defined highest standards of excellence in many ways. Congratulations, Elizabeth, and you may now open the award. Thank you, Henry. You want to see? It's gorgeous. Also, well, Ralph, we, we would expect well done from anything that is produced by the NEHGS. I have to cut my way into this. Pardon the sound of ripping paper. nice box and inside what do we find oh a gorgeous plaque from the new england historic genealogical society it's catching some reflections of my venetian lines but it's a gorgeous presentation thank you so much I have to say, we all stand on the shoulders of those who come before us. And I would not be here today without several giants before me. Not only John Coddington, Milton Rubinkin, and John Frederick Dorman, and, and others in the American Society of Genealogists who way back in 1982 saw sufficient promise in a young woman from the boonies and invited me into their fellowships. They and all of you, uh, uh, the Board for Certification of Genealogists, the Association of Professional Genealogists, the National Genealogical Society, NEHGS, and its wonderful register from which we have all learned so much. All of these have shaped the genealogists that I have become and I owe all of you. Thank you. Let me add my congratulations to you, Elizabeth Schoen Mills, for being the well-deserved winner of the Coddington Prize. And I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation. Hope you were inspired by it, learned from it, and all of us will resolve to do more and better work documenting our great genealogical finds for our family. I remember the first time I had the pleasure of hearing Elizabeth Schoen Mills. It was at a national a genealogical conference and she came down the center aisle with her wonderful wide brimmed hat uh, mounted the podium and and it was a wonderful wonderful experience and i was so inspired i promised myself i would do better documenting um, all the stuff i was finding i haven't i've fallen short on that i'm sure but the biggest problem i had was that i had done too much work before i learned my lesson so i'm i'm working back now trying to clean up the stuff i left undocumented before but we can all profit from the wise counsel to do proper documentation and make it his, make ourselves uh, uh, accurate in our history so I, I speak of this from my perch as a member of the board of trustees of NEHGS, the parent organization for American ancestors. If you enjoy this conversation and you are a member, thank you very much for your membership. If you would like to become a member, I assure you, you will be welcome. We would welcome you as a member of what we think is the best and fastest growing uh, genealogical resource to find your American ancestors. So thanks again and congratulations to our Coddington Prize winner. Now, Brendan, Brendan, I'll turn it over to you. Congratulations, Elizabeth, and thank you, Nord. Nord and Suzanne Brew are the benefactors of the Brew Family Learning Center at our society, and their dedication to educational programming is deeply appreciated by our members around the world. 
on behalf of Nord Brew, Nathaniel Taylor, Henry Hoff, and myself, thank you for joining us for this special program honoring Elizabeth Schoen Mills with the Coddington Award of Merit. I hope you will join us for other online and in-person events. On Thursday, July 28th, we will honor Downton Abbey and Gilded Age creator Julian Fellows at a dinner in Newport, Rhode Island. We will present Lord Fellows with a detailed history of his family prepared by our staff experts, and we will honor the Platinum Jubilee of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. For more information on this event and scores of other online webinars, heritage tours, and special programs, please visit us at AmericanAncestors.org. Thank you. <laughs>